All right. <clears throat> so, welcome everyone, one and all, young and small, to the Game Dads podcast. My name is Aaron, and I am with the hostess with the mostess. Oh, I'm Brett Altmiller, and I'm here. That's you. My insides are on my outside. <laughs> and welcome to the Game Dads podcast, where we talk about video games, apparently spicy wings, and everything else under the sun. Oh, dude, like, before we, like, get into topics at hand and stuff, we gotta talk about yesterday a little bit, because, like, we don't get together as often as we probably should, but Aaron and I were together yesterday, and it was amazing. Yes. So, my birthday was a couple days ago, and, you know, as an adult, you do birthday parties on days that are convenient for other adults, it's not just on your birthday. So, we had a little party yesterday. Everybody came by, got some amazing gifts from my friends, and we did a fake half-assed hot ones, and we literally got the hot ones, like, sauce pack. If you guys don't know what hot ones is, look it up, but basically you do interview questions while eating spicy wings, and I've got a cat in here who is literally trying to choke herself on some plastic, so... (laughs) <laughs> that's not good yeah yeah my cat is by my side mr thor he is the fluffiest boy <laughs> he is not trying to choke himself though no nah, it's just bb in the corner just bleh, 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 like sucking down plastic and then spitting it back up I got you. okay so if you don't know hot ones is a show where they do interview questions while eating increasingly spicy wings and Brett wrote, Brett got some questions for me and we ate spicy wings and answered them. And it, I love how it started. I absolutely love how it started. Every person was trying every, a saw a wing with every sauce on it. And then we got to that back half and the number dropped substantially really fast. Oh yeah, dude. I'll tell you the the one that impressed me was your buddy Dave. God, yeah. That dude, he knows so, like, Aaron and I, like, we went through the whole spectrum. We ran the whole gamut. It was like 10, yeah. 10 different sauces. From beginning to end, we had them all. And there were a couple that kind of doubled, doubled us over a little bit. You know, we were reeling. And Dave was sitting there like, oh, yeah, I don't do spicy food very often. You know, my... My my stomach isn't always the best thing in the world, and you know I can relate because you know I'm old too. And that dude, like he the the stuff that was doubling us over, he took it. He's like, you know what? That's not so bad. We go over and play with the kids. Just you, couple, you, couple of no sold it. Do you want to do you want to hear the secret? Did he chug milk beforehand? What's the secret? No. Okay. So this is another one of my other friends who I just met recently. And, you know, we got close to because we both are the same age. We have kids that are the same age. So like, and he lives literally like down the block from me. Like I can see his house from my front door, but Dave is actually from the Virgin islands. And they have, he was telling Andrea this story while we were all passing out from heat pain. They have a pepper there at the, in the Virgin Islands that's called Modacunt. And I've known, I've known a few Modacunts in my life. <laughs> so he, like, it's, he said, according to him, it's hot on the level of the bomb, the one that we both almost died on. <laughs> yeah, dude, I don't understand. Like, that thing was mid tier. When was it the the ending one? Yeah, what's that one called? The the last the dab, the last, the last dab is the is the last one. And like, I don't know if doing the bomb just like annihilated all of my heat receptors to the point where it didn't hurt. But the last two after that were like nothing. Yeah, I I actually went back for seconds <laughs> on uh, the last dab, and like, I and I literally like. Like I put when I put the sauce on my wing, I was like, "Are you sure?" And I was like, "You got to do extra for the last one." So like I like literally had a huge amount, and I ate it. And I was like, "This is nothing." Like I, not even a comparison to the, the bomb. Yeah, I 
I, I was impressed by the sauces. I thought a lot of them were very flavorful. I'm going to buy myself some. <laughs> yeah, like that was the it's thing that really you know, that was the thing that really impressed me about it. Like the the like the first one was just like kind of just like a basic hot sauce, and then the second one was kind of like a like a Mexican kind of blend. But then like after that, it, they got hot. They got I mean, it didn't take a, it took a while before they got hot, hot, but like they were all just like so like uniquely flavored. I was like, these are just good. Like I would put this yeah. on, I would put this on tacos every day for the next month. Like, oh, definitely. Like some of them were that good. And then like we got to the bomb and it was like, okay, this is annihilating my taste buds. Well, I, I thought the bomb was pretty good too. It was good. Yeah. It was good, but like until I, it killed me. Yeah. I literally like I took it. You can, you taste the flavor for like five seconds and then the, the heat behind it is just like, I was sitting there in my brain, like, I want to drink something, but the last thing I actually want to do is swish this around in my mouth. Like, yeah, the milk helped. Definitely. I don't know if you saw me go back for seconds on the, on the bomb. I, I lathered that thing up, dude. On that first one, I just kind of dumped it on there. Cause I was uh-huh. like, ah, <laughs> we're three away. It ain't that bad. It ain't that bad. No. It's a fire breathing dragon at this point. Yeah, it's a completely, it's a completely different, like, from like six to seven was like complete, we were in a completely different zone. Like, it was a completely different atmosphere. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. Definitely a good time though. I like that was a a unique birthday party that, like, it was, it was definitely a lot of fun. And I appreciate, Andrea kind of trusting me with a lot. She had texted me a few days ahead of time, just asked if I would be comfortable kind of like asking, like coming up with interview questions or whatever. And I asked her like, Hey, like, I don't know what the format is, but do you want me to host it? Like, like if we were to kind of do like content or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, like I mentioned it a little bit, but I kind of wish we had made that content. Like I would, I would, I would love to do it again in like a hot ones like set up oh, where definitely. it's me and you sitting across from each other at a table asking questions. Like I didn't want to like, you know, like when you put a podcast mic in the middle of a party, like that means the people who, you know, aren't part of the podcast and are just there are also part of it, or they're going to feel they need to be quiet in order for us. Like, I just didn't, I didn't want that for a party. I was just like, let's, let's, right. just, let's just enjoy it. But like to do it. I mean, I don't, know how your stomach would handle that but if we were to do it again i would absolutely do it again and like just have like us do it as a podcast thing right that for you dude i would definitely do it i think my main problem and again my problem is my gastrointestinal stuff like i can do spicy foods like no problem but i haven't had that spicy stuff i like that level of spicy things Mm -hmm. gosh it's it's probably been three, four years at at the most, like, or at least rather, it's been a while, I and mean, definitely not nothing that spicy since. I mean, not to get like too far into the weeds and stuff since I was hospitalized a couple times, like, yeah. I just. But no, it was it was totally worth it. I played a lot of Dreamcast last night. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I felt like Rob Lowe in in uh, Parks and Recreation, dude. That whole stop pooping. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I had a really, I had a really good time. Like I said, it was just a super, like, it was just a super chill experience. And I also, like, I, I, I love, I love all of my friends. And I, you know, you guys could have stayed as long as you wanted to stay. But I also love, like, now that I'm an adult, I'm like, party. We start at a time, we have fun, and then the party ends, and we everyone goes home and enjoys a nice sleep. Like I, lo- I like having those parties that, like, you know, just kind of like we do the thing, and then the thing's over, and everyone goes home and sleeps in their own bed. Yeah, yeah, we've definitely had a good time, and I think, I think the there was a, a young version of ourselves in all of our heads last night. And we all kind of wanted to keep going, mm-hmm. but the close, the, the farther past eight o'clock we went, we were just like, I gotta go. <laughs> and like, you guys got a, so, got a drive ahead of you. So like, I, I was like, yeah, everybody, let's, 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 let's all sleep in our beds. We definitely stopped at Portello last night. Chris and so, Tarya forgot their air fryer. So they came back. Oh, did they? Yeah. 
Uh, you can't live it up to air fryer. I feel you. Oh man, but that was that was great. I really appreciated it, and you know, it was just it was a good time. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to talk about some video games since it actually has been a while. Yeah. I've been collecting a lot lately, so I'm not. Sh- I think with the last episode, we were kind of talking about some of the Genesis games that I got. Mm-hmm. I got a lot more. And I've actually kind of switched lanes a little bit. I got everything that I want for the Genesis, I think. For the most part, there's a couple more Streets of Rage games I want to get. But between my son and I, dude, we probably got maybe 20-ish something games in the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. So I've got a couple extensive ones for my for my Dreamcast. I got Pyro Stone. I got Dino Crisis, Resident Evil 3. And I'm pretty excited about those ones. I bought a couple PlayStation games, even though I don't necessarily have a PS1. But I picked up the holy trinity of Final Fantasy games, so I got 7, 8, 9. Drake got his N64. He was pretty pumped about that. So he's got Resident Evil 2, which he's really excited about, and Perfect Dark and Banjo-Kazooie. Well, I'm leaving some stuff out, but we have been going real hard with these games lately, mm-hmm. and I'm ready to stop spending money. <laughs> yeah yeah that is it is one of the 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 big drawbacks of being the collector you get into a zone and then like after you get go through it for a while you're like oh shit how much money have i spent recently just buying video games dude and i talked to you last night about it like i i had to stop myself like i i allot myself money like i save up stuff i i have my own like you know video game fund and like I'm responsible with the things that I get, but we went to this new, new to us store. We had talked about it a little bit last night. I think we had been there, but like I think you had taken me there a few years back. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I remember the store, but I don't like I remember the inside of the store. Like once I got into it and stuff, but I don't really remember ever going there. If that makes sense. Yeah, I get you. But they had apparently somebody had just traded in a bunch of Sega stuff, and that's across genesis game gear dreamcast and sega saturn and i have never owned a saturn before so as i was kind of perusing through i had a a stack of dreamcast games in my hand as i do i went up to the front desk area and i noticed they had a couple saturns up there i'm like and and they were 160 bucks you know that's a pretty decently priced Saturn, especially if they're like loose or whatever, mm-hmm. they had a Model One and a Model Two. Which, brother, I, I don't know anything about Saturn, so they kind of explained it to me a little bit. But the person that helped me was incredibly knowledgeable, so I, I really appreciate their help. So I went back to their their Sega kiosk or whatever, or not kiosk, but like the the glass enclosure, which didn't have a lot of stuff in there, but they had some pretty. Like what they did have was great. So like I got a sealed copy of not sealed, but complete copy of Crazy Taxi, complete copy of Tomb Raider Chronicle. Like it's it's even got like the insert, like the it's one of those like the registration cards you send in. Mm-hmm. Uh, it expired in two thousand one, but I'm still <clears throat> considering mailing it. But they had a copy for the Sega Saturn of X Men versus Street Fighter, but it was Japanese, decently priced. Mm-hmm. It was seventy five bucks. And I kind of went down that rabbit hole of like, okay, I can buy this Saturn. How do I region break this thing so I can play this Japanese game? Like I had, dude, it was this whole like mental like set of gymnastics or whatever in my brain of like, how do I get this thing going? How do I justify spending the money on this Sega Saturn when ultimately I decided to just kind of pass on it? Mm -hmm. But it was really cool to kind of, be able to touch it and have it in my hand and kind of go through that whole journey. <laughs> but what I tell, like, I'm not, I, I don't classify myself, classify myself as a collector or anything like that. I just, I'm just not, I'm more of an enthusiast. If you can't justify the buy, if there's not games on it, you're going to play. My rule for my son is if there's five games on that console that you want to play, then go ahead and buy it. But I could not justify the money to spend on that Saturn. So I did the responsible thing. I put it back. Let's see. 
when uh, when I actually like hit that point, the first thing I'm gonna have to do is region break mine because I there's so so many Japanese only titles that came out for the Dreamcast that I want. Like I like and plus like kind of I remember one thing I specifically remember about the Dreamcast was it was or sorry, the Sega Saturn. It was so easy to (laughs) to play modded games and like you could basically just burn cds and like half-ass run them on sega saturn like i like like, that's the first thing i'd do when i get mine is i'd have to a region break it yeah i i went down that rabbit hole and i've considered doing it with my dreamcast dreamcast is so much easier to buy for in my opinion i (laughs) My my memories of the Saturn are are basically just playing what I played at your house, but you can kind of tell even now in 2024 that you know the Saturn was just kind of a it was a stopgap mm-hmm. for for Sega between the Genesis, which was you know start it, it didn't it didn't start off hot, but it got hot, and then it definitely cooled down. But they were putting the the Saturn out to kind of compete with the PlayStation, and even now, dude, like it's it's kind of hard to justify that that purchase but the people that had the saturn that really invested in it especially at the time dude love the saturn but the dreamcast is just so much easier to buy for it's got you know the the games look better i've uh i've actually got my running on a, a vga to hdmi adapter mm-hmm. which allows me to play it on uh, like a high definition television and then upscales the the vga cords is like they there's the ad stuff they are the red, yellow, white stuff, but the VGA apparently lets it run at a higher, like a higher fidelity and stuff. I got this thing running on. I had it on my sixty-five inch, but it's it, that's a little bit too much overkill. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got running on a smaller thirty-two inch TCL television, and dude, that thing is gorgeous, gorgeous. It runs so well. A lot of those games run at 60 frames a second. So like crazy taxi runs really well. Uh, some games don't support that VGA stuff, but dude, that game is just, it, it's so much more playable than the Saturn in my opinion. But I, I, I think eventually, and you and I have talked about this before, like mm-hmm. crossing that bridge and pulling that band off, bandaid off and eventually maybe just start to start that second, the Sega Saturn collection up. Yeah. I, I honestly feel like, the like don't hold me to this because i don't have a game list in front of me but like i feel like sega saturn even though it was short-lived and even though it was kind of the death of sega it still like the the games on the sega saturn on the sega dreamcast just feel like i don't know they feel bigger to me i feel like all of the big titles that were dreamcast I mean, not exclusive anymore, but at the time, like, they felt bigger to me. Like, that was the the thing that I feel like the Sega Saturn was missing. It, none of the games on Sega Saturn felt like AAA titles. Like, they all felt like, yeah. they all felt, had this kind of like, like, either like ports or like the exclusive titles that were on there were like, like something kind of like weird and niche. Like, I remember so many games that I played on Sega Saturn that like, Ex- like disappeared into the ether that don't exist anymore. There were that they, they there were no new versions of. There are no ports of. There are no like. There's stuff on the Sega Saturn that is Sega Saturn forever. If you want to play this game, you need to buy a Sega Saturn and buy it. Right. And like that's that always seemed weird to me. That always seemed like like I mean Sega is not around anymore. So obviously some of their IPs aren't you know propagating anymore. But like there's some some games on the Sega Saturn that I'm like. Why isn't there a sequel or a remake to this? Oh, yeah, dude. I mean, some of the heavy hitters definitely moved over, like Knights into Dreams and Guardian Forces, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, like, I'm a, I, I don't know, man. I've always kind of saw myself as kind of a student of the game. I don't really know what's out on the set. Yeah, like, 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 yeah, that's exactly yeah, what I'm saying. Panzer that's, Dragoon. But, yeah, Panzer Dragoon. The, like, there are just so many random titles that came out for the Dreamcast or the Sega Saturn they're just like not around anymore like I remember yeah. like it's at the point where like there are some games that I know were actually big on the on the Saturn that I just like 
I can't remember what they're called <laughs> because I know I played them, but I don't yeah. remember what they're called. And like, they only existed on the Saturn and they are, you know, gone now. So like, there are no sequels unless they're Japanese only sequels that were released somewhere that just, I don't know about. Right. Well, I, I was thinking about that excellent versus Street Fighter game and how much I wanted to play it. I've always wanted to. I've, I've never actually had the opportunity to play it. That Marvel versus Capcom collection is coming. That all those Capcom, oh, I can't wait. Marvel fighters, X Men versus Street Fighter is in that, and that's kind of like where I started thinking about the practicality of everything. You can invest that and play it on original hardware, and they had you know HDMI ad- adapters. All that good stuff. There were, I could get that thing going if I wanted to, like within the next week, you know, order some stuff on eBay, do what you got to do. But the practicality of it, I won't be able to play that on PlayStation here pretty soon anyway. So I'm going to just hold off. I can't wait for, I, I literally cannot. It's one of the games that's on my like birthday list. I literally cannot wait for that game to drop. I'm totally going to pick that up and just be by myself playing it. Right. So one of the things I was thinking about, we can move on after this if you want to, because I think we kind of spent too much time on it, but Stenka, like, you know, I'm a Capcom guy. Yeah. Capcom's my all time favorite developer. Give me Mega Man. Give me Resident Evil. Give me Street Fighter. I love all these games. Dude, Sega low key and not even really low key. If you really, if if you're kind of in the know and stuff, but dude, Sega's kind of like the, like the greatest place to play Capcom games. Yeah. Like those fighters are all there. Those, the resident evil ports from PlayStation were really good. It got its own resident evil, like exclusively code Veronica. I mean, we were, t- dude, you, me and Chris were talking about revisionist history. People hated code Veronica when it came out, <laughs> but like people love that game now, but like that game is great. But like, if you're a Capcom fan, dude, it behooves you to own a either a Saturn, which there's a, a ton of Capcom games on the, on the Saturn, but there's even more in the Dreamcast. Mm-hmm. Power Stone, like talk about games that aren't out anywhere else, dude. Where's Power Stone? God, like there's an alternate universe, dude, where the Dreamcast thrived, and we we're on Power Stone, like <laughs> we've we've got Power Stone Ultimate that can yeah. with Super Smash Bros. I was about to and, say it's it's Power Stone Ultimate and Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Yeah, and like everyone's here, you know what I mean? And this and this ultimate Power Stone game. So who are those people? No clue. No idea. No clue. But they're there. I just like uh, that is that's one of the things that like makes me want to collect for the Dreamcast and the Saturn. It's just I feel like there were so many like extremely unique games that came out for those those systems that like there isn't a replacement for. Like they're like there isn't you know there isn't a sequel there isn't a remake there isn't a remaster there isn't even a re-release it's just like there are just some games that came out on saturn and dreamcast that just you got to play them on saturn and dreamcast (laughs) yeah i there's some games that made it out and i love that but you know crazy taxi just doesn't feel the same without the offspring doesn't and it you can play that on xbox but it just it is not the same i <laughs> i Take me to pizza hut i literally remember the first time i picked up a version of crazy taxi that doesn't start with that guy with the dude from uh, from offspring going yeah 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 and i like paused it i was like what is happening right now i know how this is supposed to start and it's not starting right <laughs> <laughs> well, and dude, there are so many Offspring songs in that game. I'm a pretty big Offspring fan. Like that's they're one of my favorite bands. But you take Offspring out of that, you take like and dude, everybody now complains about advertisements and games. But the Crazy Taxi's like it's not the same without Pizza Hut. Oh my god! Like the fact that like like to think about how it was then to how it is now, and like how bad people hated that subway commercial with freaking that uncharted subway thing that they did, like how much people yeah. hated it to go back to how much we'd love driving these people to KFC and pizza and the Levi store. Yeah. It's dude, night and day difference. You just unlock something in my brain with that 
Uncharted Subway thing. They had what it was something. I it was ex, it was exclusive through Subway, and it was something you could play in the. It was was it a beta? I was it the, was the, it was the multiplayer thing for Uncharted Three. Yeah, I hadn't eaten at a Subway. That game. Oh god, when that didn't come out, two thousand eleven. I probably hadn't eaten at a Subway in maybe ten years. I don't like like Subway's Subway's whatever. I'm not gonna say I don't like Subway, but like I hadn't eaten there in years. And dude, I was so ticked that I had to go to Subway and order food. <laughs> oh my god! I just I remember. I remember what I remember is that like commercial with like like the fully rendered Nathan Drake, and then at the end is him like like man handling a wrapped subway sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> oh my uh, god! I just I, I remember everyone was like, "This is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Get this off my screen and don't ever do this again." Great game, great game, but like terrible advertising. But you know, do what you got to do. Got to get them bucks. Uh, got to get them bucks. Gotta get... Yep. Oh my god! All right, we talked too long about my stuff. What you got going on, brother? Oh god, not not a lot. I didn't remember if I if the last time we talked was before my vacation or after. It was before. Okay, so I went on vacation. I went to ghosts. I went to DC to for a family reunion to and it was like also the first time my kids had met my extended family that mostly live in St. Louis so like literally the first time they have met anyone family any family that's outside of Indiana so like aunts uncles great aunts cousins great cousins all it was like 50 of us i think like 55 at the time, the final wow. total. And like I said before, my aunt and my, she's actually my cousin, my cousin who planned the whole thing. She's a project manager, like an IT project manager whose job is to like help software and stuff get built. So she is excellent at planning and managing people. <laughs> so she found the hotel that had the best like free breakfast so we would there's literally like a buffet style breakfast every morning that all of us could go like that was big enough for 55 people to go through and a reasonable amount of time it was crazy so we get there and there's this big like restaurant area where we're all going and getting our breakfast so like literally at like nine o'clock like my entire family, like extended family, are all downstairs taking up like half of this restaurant where all of us are sitting and eating. <clears throat> That's awesome. So what'd you have? They did a rotate. It was French toast the first day, there was waffles the second day, pancakes the third day, and then back to French toast and over and over again. But like they, I mean, we're talking sausage, eggs, bacon, you know, uh make your own omelet station where like the guy that cooks behind the counter would make up your omelets for you like oh man i love that like muffins are out like five different juices that they were rotating like it was crazy it was crazy big so but like literally dom is like a chicken with her head cut off because like she understands that like every one of the people who's sitting with us is related to her in some way and this is the most people she's ever been around. And it's the most people who are part of our family that she's ever met. So she's just going from table to table, introducing herself and like running around. Like, I'm like, I have to like eat with one eye keeping on her because I'm like, I got to make sure she's staying, you know, with the family and not just talking to strangers. Yeah. But she had an absolute blast. She was just so happy to meet everybody everyone was so happy to meet her and it was just it was it was so awesome and like i was so happy to for that experience for her because like before we moved to to indiana i had a we had a, we had a huge family like we had my dad's family is huge my mom's family is huge and 80 percent of all of our family is in st louis so it was just it's more similar to how i grew up so like 
it was nice for her to like get to have that moment and like it's also really nice because if 55 people are watching after you know and there was like maybe two other kids that were her age but you have 55 people watching her so if she runs off in one direction someone's gonna grab her so i wasn't like me and Adrian weren't solely responsible for watching her the whole day. And that was nice. All right. <clears throat> and we went to the, the Frederick Douglass house. We went to the MLK Memorial. We went to the Washington monument. We went to the Jefferson monument. And then we went to the Lincoln Memorial and like, that's oh, awesome. <clears throat> the, Forgetting one other thing we did. Oh, yeah. We went to the Museum of African American History and Art. And that thing is bananas. It's like seven, it's like six stories tall. Like, it's like a museum, but it's also like a, like a chronological tour. So like you literally start in the basement and the basement is like, slavery times and then as you walk up it goes through like the reconstruction and then the civil rights movement and then like the very top is like current and this is like music and theater and you know like famous actors and stuff but like you literally as you walk up you like go through like chronological order of history and it was it was awesome it's one of those things that like if you are a person who can tolerate museums it's one of the best i've ever been to yeah, <clears throat> a very a, a well curated museum can be the difference between being like super bored and you know just everything else. I mean, so, like that's pretty cool. It's it's like the way that it's set up is so like very very specific. Like it's it's in chronological order, which is crazy to think. Like they literally like from the start of the museum from the first thing you see all the way up, it's chronological all the way up to the very top. And then like active, you know, like literally like they have like, a, <laughs> I mean, like it's kind of effed up, but it's like a literal there. Like the first part is literally like a, like a recreated like slave ship. And then like, oh, wow. as, as you start going back up, they're like, they're like, they do like, they did like a recreation of like a, like a train car based on like, like the segregation, segregated train car that you have to walk through. And like, it's all the way, uh, all the way up to the very top. It's super crazy. It was, it was, like I said, the best museum that I have ever been to. And it's literally like, it's so, it's made that way specifically because you have to like set up an appointment and have a guide take you through it. Yeah. So like they explain everything as you're going up and around all the way to the top. It's very cool. But we did that. We went to the White House. I went to the White House. That was cool. Um, yeah. The White House was, I think the tour that they have is like different since January 6th. Because like, oh, yeah. it went from, I from what I've been told, it went from like being like a, like a hour long like tour through a whole bunch of different parts to like there's just one section that you were allowed to go into and it's like the super historical side you're not even taken to the other side where like like actual anything happens it's purely like historical you don't see anybody or anything a tour guide walks you through you go through like pretty much just like one loop and then like back out the other side and out the door yeah. i Went through. We had to go through three security checks before they let us in. We had to go through one when we got to the when we got there. There were, you know, like armed officers outside, and then they pat you down, and then you go inside to where another officer pats you down, and you get a screening. They have to get you have to give your driver's license, and like they screen you. Then you go through a set of stairs and go up. And then there's another screening that you have to go through with a metal detector and a pat down before you're allowed to go in. And like I said, the place that we were, there's nothing like all there is, is paintings, pictures and security guards. Oh my gosh, dude. And I, I don't want this podcast to be incredibly you know, political because it's, it's not fair to people if they're, if they're expecting video games and get politics and stuff, but it's really sad that, 
you know, we've come to that, you know, I just, I understand the, the reasoning behind that, you know, a bunch of crazy people stormed the Capitol and all that stuff, but dude, just F MAGA. No, sorry. Oh, okay. We're going to move on. He, he said the thing. Yeah. Okay. I did say, I did say the thing, but uh, we're going right. to, so, but my, my trip to DC was awesome. I have one thing about DC that I have to complain about. I loved DC as a city, as a person. It was, I, it never felt dangerous. No, you know, it's a big city it has people walking around just like, you know, like Indianapolis or Chicago never felt dangerous at all. Like not one bit. Like I, me and Andrea were just walking around, like, you know, stop and get a bite to eat and, you know, hit up the restaurant. And then we just walk back and then catch an Uber back to the hotel. Like never felt dangerous at all. But as a person in a car, DC sucks oh man on a scale of one to chicago how was the it? worse the worst place i had ever driven in my life really i drove in the dominican republic where half the roads are dirt roads and driving in dc was worse wow it, it's so bad i like okay so let me explain the situation so in it was me Andrea, my mom, and, you know, Dom and Lee. So we decided, like, instead of trying to fly, because that's going to, you know, we had buying freaking four tickets to fly is going to be super expensive. And then, like, we still have to deal with, you know, getting around and we still have to deal with, you know, dealing with car seats because we have two. Like, it's going to be a pain in the butt. So we're like, why don't we just drive? So I pulled off the, the biggest con in history. And happened to hit one of the, like, like the flight package websites where they kind of let you like package everything to one, like Expedia and Travelocity and stuff like that. And I happened to hit it according to the lady behind the counter. I hit it within the right 24 hours of an error that was allowing people to get Suburbans for the price of compacts. So I oh got, my gosh. I got. I got a Suburban, uh, like, for, like, that could sit, that se- comfortably seats, like, nine people for, like, for a week for, like, $400. It was crazy. Like, she told me what the actual price was normally. Like, if I had gotten, I had tried to book it that day, and it was, like, $850. Holy cow. Like, I deal of the century. So, you know, I draw, I've. All my life, I've driven pretty small cars. The biggest car I've ever driven was the Jeep when I had it. And it's the Jeep kind of is better. But, I mean, my normal car is a freaking Kia Soul. So, like, I'm in this huge Suburban driving around. And, like, the Suburban, it was it was a 2000, 2014, 24. So, it was, like, brand new. Had all the bells and whistles and the little, like, icons that tell you if you're driving right in the lane and all kinds of crazy stuff that I've never dealt with before. But over the, you know, nine hours it took us to get to D.C., I got used to all of it. I was pretty comfortable driving the car at this point. Then we got to freaking D.C. And, like, driving in D.C. is, like, you have to take literally every section of road. You just got to, like, it's its own thing. Like, I literally... We were driving down the road. The car said, the navigation said, turn left. I look to my left. There is a no entry sign. There is a, you know, like parking sign. There's a one way sign. There's like every sign you can imagine is on my left. Then I look and like on the left behind those roads going down is a tiny little piece of road is where I'm actually supposed to go that turns left, then goes into a tunnel that I can't see that's under me in a circle around and then goes back out like to the right. So I have, I'm like looking at the, 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 the map quest or like the map quest, the Google directions. It looks like I'm turning left, but I'm actually turning right because I'm turning left into a tunnel that turns right. I was like, how does anyone without Google 
drive it here. It doesn't make none of this makes any fucking sense. I'm looking at a no turn, a no entry sign. Like there are roads that like like you're crossing a road and then like in the middle of the road there'll be another stop sign, another stoplight that like you half cross the road, stop in the middle between like a left lane and a right lane. And then you have to wait for that light to turn green to go the rest of the way across the street. It is literally the worst place I have ever driven in my entire life. I like, wow. if I ever go to DC again, there is 0% chance that I will drive anywhere. I'm like, nope, I'm just going to take Ubers. I don't care. I don't care how much it costs. I'll just take Uber yeah. the entire time I'm there. Cause this is, this is a hellscape. <laughs> and like the DC has a very active, let's say health community, because like there are people on bikes, there are people walking, there are people running, there are people on rollerblades and everything all over the place. And not only do you have these streets to deal with, the they have their own lights and from what i could tell their lights take priority over yours none of those people have any any kind of idea of like watching traffic waiting for traffic waiting for cars to go by no you're waiting on them and yeah. if that means you're sitting at a light for four t- instances in a row because the what people walking just did not give you a chance to drive through that's what's happening like i was like I'm never driving this place like ever again. It was terrible. And like, I'm with my cousins and all of them. And, you know, they had a, like, they had like a giant sprinter. Cause like they came in, like we're coming from Indiana. So, you know, we're pretty much solo, but like there were, you know, like 10 or 15 of them coming from the same family. And like, they're like, all right, well, why don't we just get a big sprinter van and we'll just do it together with, you know, 16 seats or whatever. So they like drive this giant sprinter. So he has this giant sprinter that he's trying to drive. And I was having trouble in the suburban. I was like, I don't know how you have been doing this all week. And he's like, he's like, I, he was like, I have gone to and from the exact same place four times and never driven on the same road. Huh. Like, no, no, thank you. Never again. I won't do it ever again. I hated it. I hated every minute of it. But other than that, other than the how hard it was to drive around in DC, DC is awesome. I would totally go and visit again, but I won't drive. I'm glad you had a good time. It was awesome. And DC is beautiful. And another thing that I learned, people say talk about all the time how flat Indiana is. But you don't know how flat Indiana is until you start driving like towards the Appalachia and driving around. Yeah. Indiana is flat. It is yeah. so flat. It is ungodly flat. It is the flattest. It's like a fucking freaking pancake in the middle of the United States. It's so flat. And even like going down to like Kentucky and Tennessee and stuff, like that, that's like night and day difference between you know, what you said flat and just everything else. I was yeah. just, I, I was amazed. We were driving through like Maryland and a little bit of Pennsylvania. And like, like, it's just like up one hill, down, another, up, down, up, down, up, down, all like hours of driving, just up and then down, up and down. And like you drive through Indiana, you can drive from freaking the freaking Chicago all the way to Terre Haute and you won't, like maybe one or two hills the entire way, but very cool. That is that is that is my vacation story. And like I said, vacation was awesome. It, I had a great time. I caught up with all my cousins and stuff who I haven't seen since the last the last family reunion, which was when we went to New Orleans, which was awesome. But yeah, the, and the last thing I'll say is when we went to New Orleans. I met all of my cousin's kids and in kid terms, it's crazy how much five years is. It was like, I met all of these kids when we were in new Orleans and then I met them again when we were in DC and like four of them are taller than me. Like (laughs) some of them are like 
just like getting ready to go to college and stuff. I'm like, like, I don't recognize any of you. I had to like, I apologize because I don't look that much different. So you guys probably remember me. I don't remember any of you <laughs> because you guys look completely different from the last time I saw you. And like, literally yeah. they had to like start reintroducing themselves. And I'm like, okay. I remember who you are now, but like, sorry, I don't, I didn't remember you. <laughs> yeah. And the kids grow way too quick. I feel like that with my nephews sometimes too. Do all my nephews, like they're all like a foot taller than me. <laughs> Nuts. Oh man. But, but it was an awesome trip. It was an awesome trip. Good. I'm going to take a drink here. I think I also need to hydrate. It's important. Well, you want to talk about the man? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The myth, the legend. Okay, so the fabled Akira Toriyama episode that we've been promising for, I, I honestly think it's been like five months at this point. <laughs> yeah, he's, well, we, I think we were playing it even before he had passed. But, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've uh, I've kind of done some homework as well. I know you've got notes. I'm, as I said at the top of the show, I'm a hot dog in it. Which I know doesn't mean exactly what I'm saying, so it's, deal with it. It's all good. Okay, so <laughs> Akira Toriyama is, if you don't know, is the creator of Dragon Ball Z, but he's been involved in tons of stuff. His influence is all over the place. Like, I mean, literally, if you look at and to go to the anime route, if you look at any of the most recent popular animes that have come out in the last 15 years, they will tell you that Dragon Ball Z or specifically Akira Toriyama was an influence on them in some way, shape, or form. And if they don't verbally say that, you can see in their artwork and the way that their stories run, Akira Toriyama influenced them one way or another. Right. So the first thing that I, the first thing that I found during my research that made me like, that was something that I didn't know about him. So like Akira Toriyama, Literally in his biography quotes, 101 Dalmatians is the thing that got him into animation. Like what? In his bio, he literally says, for what reason? He saw the animation in 101 Dalmatians and thought it was so gorgeous. He was like, I need to do this. This is now something I want to put in my life because I saw 101 Dalmatians and thought it was so awesome that I want to become an animator. That is, that is the truth from his bio, from his autobiography. What got him into animation? 101 Dalmatians. Interesting. <clears throat> I would have never thought that Disney would influence him in that, in, like in that way. Maybe from like literally anything else, but 101 Dalmatians. But hey, that's awesome. Yeah. And it's one of those things that like, like you get this thing that like, all animation is like this competitive thing and like the, this like battle that's anime versus, and you know, American animation and all this stuff. But like it, it's amazing how many times you find that like Japanese artists are influenced by American artists or American artists are influenced by Japanese artists. It's like, I, I love that. I love that 101 Dalmatians is the thing that got him. Like, that's so crazy to me. So, like, I know, like, most people, like, know Akira, if they know Akira Toriyama, they know him for Dragon Ball Z, but, like, Akira Toriyama actually had a bunch of other stuff that he did before Dragon Ball Z, and a lot of stuff since Dragon Ball Z, and a lot of stuff that he worked on while he was working on Dragon Ball Z. The main, one of his, like, the main thing that would, like, influence him and, like, kind of become the baseline for Dragon Ball that rolled us into Dragon Ball Z is Dr. Slump. And it's just, it's Akira Toriyama's weird love of like robots and science and cars and stuff. And then his love for potty humor put together in, in, yeah. in a cartoon. And that's Dr. Slump. That's exactly what it is. It's those two things, and he just, like, slam them together, and it's a scientist who makes a little girl who uh, makes all kinds of weird potty humor jokes. It's 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 exactly what you would expect it to be if you were, like, if you didn't watch Dragon Ball Z, and you just watched Dragon Ball, and then you were like, this guy has another another manga, you'd be like, is it just a bunch of fart jokes? And he's like, yeah, it kind of is. 
but Dr. Slump is actually like for, for like anime and like Japan, like Japanese kids. Like it's not that it, I'm not, not even going to say that it's as well known or more well known than Dragon Ball because it's Dragon Ball is equally popular. Well, for the time in Japan than it is that it was in the United States, but like more people in Japan know Dr. Slump than US people know Dr. Slump. It's just the way that it that it operates, it operated really well on Japanese TV because Japanese TV loves potty humor. Yeah. <clears throat> but after that, he created another well, not technically after that, because Dr. Slump continued, but while he was making Dr. Slump, he also made the first two part shorts called Dragon Boy. And Dragon Boy is what eventually became Dragon Ball, and the main character of Dragon Boy is literally like Goku minus a little polish. And then like right. <clears throat> after he made it, which is this is kind of the cycle that uh, that um manga goes through. The manga creator will make something, but it's not actually the show. Like it's not actually Dragon Ball, but it's very similar. And then they'll put it on Shonen Jump. And then like the Shonen Jump audience eats it up. If they do, then they'll go, okay, well, let me polish this a little bit. And then I'm going to make it a big story. And then he polished it and made Dragon Ball. <clears throat> it's like the creator of One Piece has one that's called Monster. And it's literally like, like I think two of the main characters of One Piece are actually in Monster. And then it like, he was like, oh, well, you guys like this. Well, let me polish a little bit. And then One Piece. Like, it's just kind of the way they do things. I don't know if it's a right. requirement for Shonen Jump, but, like, it kind of feels like it. Because every big manga has this little one-shot story that the creator made that's extremely similar to the the big story that they created. But it's, like, just a little, like, 60-page little thing that they put out just to, like, get put out some feelers to see if people like it. <clears throat> so that's Dragon Boy. Then Dragon Boy, he polishes it up and then it becomes Dragon Ball. And Dragon Ball, which is an interesting thing to think about, when it first dropped into Shonen Jump, it wasn't disliked, but it wasn't like the super popular. It wasn't an instant success. So the first season of Dragon Ball, if in, if you know Dragon Ball, is kind of different than the rest of dragon ball it's got the same kind of humor feel to it but like the first season of dragon ball is like it's the journey to the west it's just basically like a big giant story of goku and bulma going around find the dragon balls they meet yamcha and all this stuff and they meet oolong and then like they find the dragon balls goku transforms into the Zaru at the end and then like boom everything kind of works out at the end and then everyone almost kind of goes their separate ways. And then season two of Dragon Ball is where Goku goes to train with Roshi before the first Tenkachi Budokai that he joins. Then when that happens and they actually enter the Tenkachi Budokai and the tournament happens is when Dragon Ball like takes off like a rocket and people absolutely love it. And they're like, it becomes the most popular manga in Shonen Jump. And it becomes like the most popular series that was going on in Japan at that time. And like skyrockets to success. But like the first season of Dragon Ball, while people like it, loved it and like liked it, it wasn't like this instant phenomenal hit that it kind of feels like it would be because the Dragon Ball is so popular. But it, it actually wasn't. Can I pause you for just a second? Yep. Go right ahead. Again, I don't want to get political or anything like that on here. By breaking, Biden just dropped out. Really? And he and he endorsed Kamala Harris. Dang. Yeah. I, Anyways, Toriyama. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I was. Not not today anyway, but wow. Damn. Kamala's got my vote. Oh, hundred percent. But I was not expecting that. Yep. Okay. All right. Back into the to the, the dragon. <laughs> Dragon Breaking news. Breaking news. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z. Okay. Yeah. So from there, you know, Dragon Ball eventually morphs into Dragon Ball Z and, you know, becomes this super crazy popular series that we know today. Right. In the meantime, and while he's 
still in Dragon Ball mode. He also does the character design and artwork for Dragon Quest. And he also does character design and artwork for Chrono Trigger, Tabal, and some other animes and mangas. He also, like, lends some story ideas, to that are less credited, but just, like, some other stuff that he has his hand in. So he's kind of just all over the place. <clears throat> we, like, like I said, we in America kind of know, if you know Akira Tom- Toriyama, you know him s- exclusively for Dragon Ball Z, but... He's kind of, he's kind of like, once he hits his stride within Dragon Ball Z, he kind of becomes this like resource of just knowledge of manga and like a lot of, he, he has his hand in a lot of different stuff, even though it's not like, you know, he's not putting his name at the top of a credits list, but like he has his hand in a lot of different things. And he has, you know, he has collabs with other, with other artists. He has, you know, since Dragon Ball Z is so popular, he was, he had this ability to like, he would give notes to other artists that he thought were really going to be influential. He, you know, he had this kind of like, that like heads up nod to get artists into Shonen Jump because he was so popular and he had worked with him for so long. He would, you know, if he saw another manga artist who he thought was really, you know, who had a really like unique idea or something that he really took to, he would, you know, kind of give them the bump at Shonen Jump to get them published. So like, there are a lot of artists who like, I'm not, I'm not going to say because anime fans will come at me about it if I do, but like, he has like, he has influence at Shonen Jump. So there are a lot of artists who like were helped by him, were, you know, like encouraged by him or who were influenced by him to make their series more popular. Like, Specifically, the one I'm going to point out to because it's very like, this is cut and dry that Akira Toriyama had something to do with this and no one's can like come and come at me about it is Taito Kubo, the guy who made Bleach. When he originally sent his first version of Bleach in, he didn't get the response that he wanted. And Akira Toriyama was like, yo, I don't know what they're talking about. This is good. Continue working on it. Don't give up. And I, I promise you, if you don't give up, this will get published. Like, don't quit. This is great. And then a Bleach is like part of the big three is, which is Naruto, Bleach, and One Piece as like, there was a period of time after Dragon Ball Z's sales, after Dragon Ball Z's serialization ended. These, those three manga were like the biggest selling manga in the world for a very long period of time. And like, when, the author of Bleach first tried to get Bleach published. He was like, he thought he was just going to give up. And like, Akira Toriyama was like, no, don't do that. Like, this story is awesome. You need to like, you need to keep working on it and get this published because it's awesome. And like, Taito Kubo like cites Akira Toriyama as the reason that he continued working on Bleach to get it published. That's incredible. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> like I said, he has his hand in all kinds of things and like, like I said, people in, in the West most know him for Dragon Ball Z, but he has his hands in tons of other stuff. <sighs> so, uh, one. one of the best things that, like, the one of the things that I think is really interesting about Akira Toriyama as a person is, even though he has this, like, insane, like, influence on the manga, the, the anime and manga world, he feel like... If you like read his bios and listen to the way he talks about himself, he doesn't have that grandeur about himself at all. Like someone asked him like in like an interview, like he which it cares around, but rarely ever actually does interviews. He doesn't like to be like out in public. He's just not that kind of guy. But like yeah. someone asked him, like, what's your perfect day like? Like, what's the perfect day in Akira Toriyama in Akira Toriyama's life? And it's literally him building a model car, drinking a beer and reading a porno mag. And I'm like, I don't believe that at all. <laughs> what? You don't read porno mags. Browsing a porno mag. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm just joking. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> that's like for like a dude who like, I looked at for such a very long time as like this, like super awesome creator and all this stuff to like, read about what he the way he sees himself and just like the chill person that he is i'm like that dude's that dude's cool as hell that's cool to like have that much influence in the world to like 
have a like one of the most highly read stories of all time that you created and then just be like, oh, eh, whatever. I'm like, it's not, it's not to say that I don't think that Akira Toriyama likes Dragon Ball, but like he definitely has some like indifferent feelings about it because I, I feel like the way that he kind of words it is that it made his life more complicated than he ever wanted it to be. Right. And like, well, you, I mean, that's like most, I, most artists that have, and not just like, like drawing artists, music, TV, sometimes people just end up, if something blows up like the way it did, sometimes they end up despising their work like that. Just, they want to be known for something, something else or, or whatever, you know, but I totally get that. Yeah. And like another thing that I can say, and this is opinion. So, Please don't come and like castrate me that I'm speaking in Akira Toriyama's voice or whatever. But like, I feel like (sighs) when you look at like what he did before Dragon Ball and what he did after Dragon Ball, you can definitely tell that Akira Toriyama is a comedy writer who just went with the flow of his show. Like, like if you look at like Sandland and then like, like I said, Dr. Slump, you can tell that like those are like, the wheelhouse he wanted to be in, but Dragon Ball just kind of kept evolving into more of like an action shonen than he ever anticipated it to. Like when he started writing Dragon Ball, he didn't plan on it being a like a super martial arts, like people only care about the fights type of show. Like he, he definitely, it was definitely going to be a martial arts show from the beginning. He was always a big martial arts fan. So it was going to be that from the beginning, but I don't think he ever thought it was going to get to the level that Dragon Ball Z got to. Right. And like, you can also kind of tell that because like, like when you get, when you go to the transition from Dragon Ball to Dragon Ball Z, first off, there in the Japanese original release, there is no transition. Dragon Ball, the manga is Dragon Ball from Goku being a kid all the way to the end of Z. It's all just called Dragon right. Ball. So, yeah. <clears throat> so like, you can definitely tell, like, when you get to the end of Dragon Ball and then go into Dragon Ball Z, where it kind of moves even further into this, like, fighting direction, even though, like, the end of Dragon Ball is technically a tournament. But, like, it goes to this point where, like, Goku becomes a Saiyan and, like, everything goes into space and all that. And like, you can definitely tell that like that part por- portion of it is like, he wasn't thinking that at the beginning of Dragon Ball when he wrote, you know, Pilaf gang running around and you know, everyone getting Dragon Balls, you know, like that wasn't where he thought this was going to go, but it just kept evolving and he just kept taking it with him. And then once he got to Dragon Ball Z, he was just kind of like, I want to do space now. So I'm going to do space. Yeah. I actually, you know, we're, we're going to kind of talk about our own experience with, with, with his work and all that stuff, but I'm about halfway through GT right now. I've, I've seen it, but I've not seen it in its entirety and mm-hmm. I've not seen it consistently. Like I've been watching it and like, I really like the start. Co- I mean, I texted you about this as I was watching it too, mm-hmm. but I really like the, this, the contrast between Z and GT. Like I know he wasn't like super involved with GT, but. Yeah, I like the adventure aspect of it, which I mean, I, I really like from the original Dragon Ball as well. Like you can tell, like, and even with Sandland and stuff too, just he loves that, like, that adventure style with yeah. the comedy and all that stuff as well. I just I love the adventure aspect of it. Yeah, that's one of those things that I I love about Dragon Ball Z, and I think it's one of the reasons that it's always been like a a favorite of mine no matter like what else i'm involved in i've always liked it but like the thing is like akira toriyama has this thing that like i feel like a lot of other artists don't do and definitely don't do as well like a dragon ball z is kind of like where it where he leaves that a little bit behind especially once we get towards like the cell saga and like the boo saga kind of brings it back a little bit but like dragon ball z is always kind of it's always partially comedy. Like no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, there's always somewhere in the background, a comedic aspect to it. Like even like the cell saga, which 
you know, is super serious, has Hercule who shows up at the end and just like totally tones turns the tone back down before everything heats back up again after he Hercule goes away. And then like Yeah. The Boo saga is like this super serious, crazy, intense like when you look at it from like a story perspective, like just people are kind of dying left and right. All kinds of crazy stuff is going on. And then like Gotenks shows up and then like yeah. takes the tone down a little bit and then things get serious again. And then at the end of that, Hercule shows back up and then the tone goes back down a little bit for a while before the climax of the end. And then like, it right. always happens. Like it every time, like even like we're on planet Namek with Frieza around every corner. He's slaughtering people. He's, you know, this tyrannical dictator who's just murder, murder, and death. And all he wants to do is find us and kill us. And then freaking Ginyu Force shows up. Yeah. Like it all, he always, every, like, he has this very, like, well planned out way where he can, like, take things as serious as serious can get. And then, like, especially, like, thinking about how the Ginyu Force works, like, when you go back to that moment in Dragon Ball Z, like F- Vegeta is like having an absolute conniption. He's like, Oh my God, the Ginyu force is coming and they're going to get here and they're going to mess everything up. Everyone's going to die. We have to like, and then they show up and start dancing. Oh. Like that's, <laughs> that's like, like it's one of those things that like Akira Toriyama does perfectly where he just like, will take everything to the height of height, and then he cuts the tension with like some ridiculous comedy character who shows up out of nowhere. Yeah, I, I love that aspect of it though, and that's one of the things too that I watched Kai last year, and you know, there's still some of that like levity involved with it, but not as much as if you watch it straight through, like with the original series. Mm-hmm. And it almost kind of like that context is like they get their driver's license, you know, <laughs> like. Like, that's funny. You know what I mean? Like, a super serious guy like Piccolo and, like, this... Goku, Goku's a doof. You know what I mean? You know, these two guys, like, you know, they're the two of the strongest people, you know, in existence and stuff, and they just go have to go get the driver's license. <laughs> like, that's some, like... That's, like, Hanna-Barbera style, like, nonsense. Like I said, that that is one thing that I love about Dragon Ball Z, and it's one of the reasons that, like, it'll always be one of my favorites, no matter what comes along, just because it's... Like, I always talk about how Dragon Ball Z has this, like, like, people know, people know, like, a lot of what happens in Dragon Ball Z, but, like, they don't, you don't always think about the context of how it happens. And, like, that's where Dragon Ball Z shines, because some of it, the context of it is ridiculous. Some of it is insane. And, like, like, people are like, oh, man, like, man, I love Gohan so much. And then he became the great Saiyan man. And now he's, now he's lame because he's a great Saiyan man. I'm like, yeah, but he's a teenager who has superpowers that are, I don't know. I don't There's no way to even quantify how strong Gohan is at that point. But like now he is on earth with a bunch of random people and no one is in, in the stratosphere of how strong he is. What is he going to do? What what is what is he going to do with all that all that power? Like what what else do you do? He's literally Superman. What does Superman do? He puts on a costume and he saves people because he's that much more powerful than everyone else around him. Like I love Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> yeah, I think I we both do. Do what about like the video game aspect of it? Like that I think that's probably my favorite part. I, mean, I love Dragon Ball Z. I love Dragon Ball but he, like his influence on video games, mm. like to kind of like tie that back and stuff. And you look at the like the Dragon Warrior slash Dragon Quest stuff, Chrono Trigger. Most recently, like the uh, the Sandland game that's come out, like his influence just like on not just art, not just television, not just comic books, but video games is just like pop culture in general is just unheard of. Yeah, it's. It's crazy because like, like the the thing that makes I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm totally gonna talk about video games. So just let me say this last thing. Like the yeah, thing that it, the it. thing that makes Akira Toriyama's influence so specifically unique, and I'm not saying like unique in a way there won't ever be another person who has this much influence, but like in a way, kind of won't be. Is Akira Toriyama 
is one guy who wrote Dragon Ball Z. And Dragon Ball Z influences so many other things. But, like, to have your one story be that influential and it ha- it was exclusively written by you, like, one person wrote Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Z has that much influence, meaning, like, one person has this much influence over the entirety of video games, movies, you know, animes, like one guy is like insane. Yeah. Like like there are so many other stories who have crazy amounts of influence, but those stories also have tons of other writers involved and tons of other, you know, like people involved it. Like Hiro Toriyama has like the, like, like Tolkien level influence. And like, I would say even more because Tolkien, like the Lord of the Rings games that exist kind of follow the mold of other games that were made in that generation while Akira yeah. Toriyama like like he kind of like the way that Dragon Ball like like Bodokai's and like Dragon Ball Bodokai and Bodokai Tenkaichi and Raging Blast kind of have made this influence on other like other like IP based fighting games like that's like those games created their own like mode to try to capture what a dragon ball z fight looks like but now like other animes and other stories like use that mold to try and like capture their story so but it was kind of invented in bodokai yeah like crazy 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 influential or do you want to go next with the with uh i'll let you kind of uh, I, i will absolutely steer the ship but i'll let you go first I want to talk about like your personal experiences since we're a video game podcast. Let's talk about our personal experiences with Dragon Ball Z related games. And we kind of have a unique perspective because I'm, I'm a nerd and my brother was a nerd and James's brother was a nerd. So we got a lot of like exclusive games that were exclusive to Japan for a very long time and we played them. Yeah. So like we can talk about that a little bit. Actually, that's kind of a great, that, that, that's a great topic to kind of bring up too because when i moved into the neighborhood you guys already had all these like pre-existing like friendships and stuff so i was kind of a i was always kind of an outsider and i didn't grow up with and i guess to kind of preface it when i say grow up i i was eight when i moved to the to the neighborhood and i maybe nine something like that and i didn't have these experiences with anime or anything like that like the closest thing that I had, or the the closest link I had to Japan was Nintendo. And even that was like super limited. So when I started hanging out with you guys, you know, and you guys started introducing me to a lot of different things from stuff like Final Fantasy and, and the Mana series, but like different kinds of animes. Like, you know, you guys were really kind of on that. I compared the wrestling a little bit to where like back in the day before we had the internet and stuff, we if we really wanted to see something that was happening in like Japan or Mexico or something like that, we would trade tapes. That's how I discovered Chris Jericho in the mid nineties and stuff. And just like I, I've got his like Corazon de Leon stuff from from Mexico and Lionheart stuff from Japan. And I was able to kind of see what he was like before he debuted in ECW and WCW and stuff. So we're the same sort of idea. But you guys would get these episodes of Dragon Ball Z, and I saw them all kind of like broken up. So like it wasn't like from start to finish or anything like that until I got to the Cartoon Network. But you guys had the toys, you guys had the games, and you guys don't, you guys didn't just have like the games. Like now you got the Budokai stuff. Like you can just, I can, I can go to Best Buy right now and buy Kakarot. You would have to because they weren't very, they weren't readily available here in the states. They were fairly unknown but you guys would import that stuff oh yeah so my my introduction to dragon ball and anime just in general were through your video games and like my parents wouldn't buy me a lot of stuff i really had to like birthdays and christmas like that was really about it and even even then like if they didn't really know what it was they had a hard time going to find it so like you know most of the stuff that i got was like ninja turtles or because they knew what ninja turtles were so being able to play stuff like hyper dimension or mm-hmm. you know ultimate battle 22 or like the the gt game on saturn or you know the the various games you had on on the playstation that you would either like import or you know uh, 
or, mm-hmm. or whatever. Like that was my introduction to it. And then just kind of getting into Chrono Trigger, and that's probably jumping the sh- jump at the gun a little bit here, but and then and of course, like I guess when it when it hit the cartoon network, that was my experience with it. And as an outsider, kind of just and this speaks to kind of his ubiquity and be able to, you know, bring in a, a an audience that maybe not familiar familiar with anime or anything like that. Like he was able to in his art style and writing the the charms and, and quirks of the characters, like how all these different, you know, these different personalities kind of mesh with each other. The the depth of the, of the villains was able to ca- you know captivate a you know a young and impressionable Brent Altmiller. It's pretty incredible, dude. Yeah, like <clears throat> my my obsession, my like love for Dragon Ball Z. You know, I like we basically figured out. You know, I, I I don't even I don't even have an answer for how how this was discovered. It was between my brother and his friends, but like literally found a way that they could order and like have things ship. Like I mean, it, I'm talking literal like we're talking magazines, like cutting the back out and like emailing them to an address with a check. Like like we're talking crazy and like my my brother and his friends figured it out and like we had a japanese version of hyper dimension dragon ball z hyper dimension for super nintendo which like we had to buy a converter that you put on top of your your super nintendo to play super famicom games and like so we had that we had dragon ball z legends for playstation which again needed another converter to be able to play the japanese games on which we had and then we had Ultimate Battle 22, Dragon Ball Final Bout, which is the one that's like all GT stuff. And then what is the last one I'm thinking of? Oh, God. Maybe maybe I was just thinking about Ultimate Battle 22. But like like me, like we were we were obsessed and like any t- time we get our hands on anything, any way that we could possibly get it, like we literally had like VSS VHS tapes of like a couple of the Dragon Ball Z movies that were like, we had to get shipped, like shipped from Japan. Some kid in Japan recorded a freaking like tape and then like a blank DB, a blank VHS tape sent it in the, in the mail to us. And like, we had like, I had like a tape of movie. I know I had movie 12, the one with Janimba and I'm pretty sure we also had Cooler's Revenge and the one with Super Android 13. Those are the ones I remember specifically. They were like taped like back to back. So like the tape would have one movie, then the next movie, then the next movie. So if you wanted to watch, you literally had to fast forward through, but I never did. I just watched them all the way through every time. But like that's how bad obsessed we were as kids about Dragon Ball Z. And like the idea, I mean, this is like he was saying, like the idea of the internet and like, going online to like find out information. It was, you could like go online, but basically what you're looking at is like some other kid who did the same thing, made a website in geo cities that just talks about how much they love dragon ball Z. Like you were barely finding any information and it was so hard to find anything, but like my brother and his friends were just as obsessed with me as me. So like they were going through and like, you know, spending their money from like their, you know, paper routes and stuff to like make money to have money to like import Japanese games so we could play them on the PlayStation. Like, but the fact about the fact that like, that like stuff like that, the reliance to like have this stuff to just get Dragon Ball Z stuff just tells how like how universal it was to the point where like people were so obsessed that they were creating these channels to like to get other fans to be able to get access to this stuff like it's yeah crazy to me to like in nowadays with like the internet anything that happens anywhere you know it's not you're not going through a hundred steps you're not sending a blank check to a stranger with no insurance that anything's going to come of it to like get stuff that you want like if you want to get something from japan you can go on a website somewhere and find it like someone has it you know, there's a, 
you know, a verified friggin' Amex or, or American Express or something sticker. So you know, your money's not going to it down the drain. You can find a verified and like, you know, secure way to find that stuff. But like yeah. the time we're talking about, like you, were, like I said, they were literally sending blank checks, sending checks to strangers, hoping that the, right. that, the, that the thing was going to come back. And then it, the mail wasn't as fast. So like you're sending a check to a stranger and then a month later, something hopefully shows up. Like it was, dude, that's punk rock. <laughs> like, I know I'm serious. Like, I want, you know, a lot of, and I don't want to be like old man, you know, as a clown, whatever type stuff, but like, you know, kids, they, they don't know what punk rock really like means, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's like underground. It's punk rock, dude. Yeah. It's, it's word of mouth. It's, you know, you, you discover something and you, know, you like with the geo cities and all the fan sites and stuff, the message boards, and like the, the word just kind of spreads. And, you know, like if it wasn't for those people in the early, in the early days like that, you know, your brother and, and Chris and, mm-hmm. you know, like who's to say we wouldn't have known about it at least not till later, you know, like it's, it's, it's punk rock, dude. Yeah. And uh, that's awesome. And it and it was it was beautiful. And like as and like the cool the coolest thing about it is, you know, I'm I get to claim that that I get to claim that OG fandom of Dragon Ball Z. I get to claim that. And like it's not yeah. as it's not as prestigious now, but like when Dragon Ball Z went from being a show that came on at seven o'clock in the morning on Saturdays that only played like five, like 15 episodes of Dragon Ball Z on a loop for four years to being like the most popular show that was on Toonami. And like kids would like literally rush home from school every day to like get home to watch the episode or stuff or whatever, like run off the bus to like run in the house so they could not miss the beginning of Dragon Ball Z. Like I got to, and at that time period, I got to be like, I am the OG Dragon Ball Z, a Dragon Ball Z fan. No one can question. I am the OG. You guys, yeah. you know, I was talking about Dragon Ball Z before you guys had ever seen it. Like, right. and you know, that was my, my little claim to f- fame as nerdy 13 year old Aaron. But like, it was always, it's always been like a part of me. Like I've always loved Dragon Ball Z and like a lot of people, you know, have a mixed opinions about it now, but like, I've always been a fan. Like I, I, no one who knows me can ever question if I was ever a fan of Dragon Ball Z. Like I, I'm not right. a poser. I was never doing it to be cool. I, I love Dragon Ball Z way before it was cool. Right. And I, you know, you can kind of throw me into that category too, probably. Yeah. You know, you're like, in there. Again, like, yeah. Like, from the from the not from the infancy and stuff but like i'm part of that like word of mouth crowd or whatever so you know i maybe i didn't do like all the little things and stuff but like i was a part of it at least i I felt like you guys made me feel like i was a part of that yeah and Um, it's 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 just like i remember like when dragon ball z started taking off and everyone was kind of getting into it and you know like toonami was like they were, you know, they were bursting at the seams with anything. If they got, had more Dragon Ball Z, they were like, oh man. And like, again, let me explain. Like nowadays when something new is coming out, you hear about it. Cause like someone on the internet is like, oh, hey, they just released the next picture from, from Deadpool versus Wolverine. This is what this person looks like in the movie. Like you got all of these little teasers and you knew yeah. exactly when something was going to drop. And as soon as, the studio approves the next season of whatever show that you like. Someone's on the internet talking about it. And like back then it was like, you found out when the new episode started playing, like, like Tom would get on there and be like, Hey, we got new episode of Dragon Ball Z coming out next week. You better be on at home to watch them or you're just going to miss them. Yep. And yep. like, and that was how, it, that's how it went. Like you just had to like, you had to be watching your TV, see the promotion that played in the commercial break about the new episodes when they started. And if you miss it, the new episodes would just start and you would just not know that there were new episodes out. So you, that was like, that's why my TV was such a big thing in our generation. And it's less of a big thing in your guys' generation and the younger generation, because like, yeah, 
that was how you found out. Like you had to be watching Cartoon Network or someone that you knew had to be watching it to see the commercial about the new episodes. Because if you didn't see it, you just didn't know they were playing new episodes. Right. Yeah. Dude, Toonami was a godsend for that stuff too. You know, being able to like, especially for somebody like me that didn't really have the means to be able to import that stuff, you know, himself. Mm -hmm. Being able to just watch that. It it was appointment television. Again, I, you know, like you were saying, dude, like kids today will understand that because everything is just so readily available. Like I can get on Crunchyroll right now and, and, you know, pick literally whatever I want. Right. You know, and, and same thing goes for like the WWE network and stuff. You know, with I was talking about like importing you know tapes of you know Chris Jericho and all that stuff. I can just get on WWE network and just watch whatever I want, or you know YouTube or what have you. You know, it just the the Cartoon Network was such a big, and vital piece of that anime puzzle, especially Dragon Ball. Like getting that into the into the hands, so to speak, of of these new and like hungry fans you know before that dude cartoon network was like it was hannah barbera stuff you know but you know the tsunami you know that block of anime that they have with you know gundam and sailor moon and dragon ball z and the other one the tenchi muyo yep like it i mean it transformed a lot of people into that would maybe not otherwise have been anime fans and do anime fans yeah and and it's one of those things where there it's one of those things that I feel like will never like it'll never be replicated that that tsunami era will never there'll never be another situation that's like it just because the way that we you know receive our information in our media is so different now, but like right. literally what tsunami was doing, and this is a you know, sidebar on the curatorial top, but literally what tsunami was doing was they would take like like super popular animes and they would, you know, whatever English translation they could get their hands on, they would just play them. And like, they drew everybody in with the, with Dragon Ball Z and Gundam wing and stuff. And they were like, this is anime. So if you like this stuff, Toonami, we're going to be playing it all the time. Whenever to whenever it's, whenever Toonami airs, you're going to be seeing stuff like this. So then, you know, Dragon Ball Z and Sailor Moon and, you know, Gundam Wing was what drew people in, but then they would pick these little random, popular in Japan but less known animes, and then they'd chuck them in between those shows. And they'd be like, oh, well, this is Cowboy Bebop. What do you guys think about this? This is Outlaw Star. What do you guys think about this? And then, like, they were, like, subtly turning an entire generation of kids into anime fans by, like, constantly pumping these little shows in between the big ones. And like, I mean, there are people who will tell you like, oh, my first 10 animes were Sailor Moon, Gundam Wing, Dragon Ball Z, Pokemon, you know, like Cowboy Bebop, Outlaw Star, Big O, like, like, and that list is just like a list of shows that played on Toonami in order. Yeah. <laughs> like in chronological order too. Right. <laughs> and like, I mean, I, 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 hey, Toonami is still around, I think, but like, the amount of influence that that viewing block had on like a generated our generation of like people who grew into adults can't be understated because they they were playing that perfectly just like every every like two or three months when you got tired of that like 12 episode or six, or 26 episode show running they would just flip it out for a different one but they kept the ones that ran for hundreds of episodes right in the middle so like if you got on to watch Dragon Ball Z, you start at Dragon Ball Z at, at four o'clock or whatever, five o'clock, whatever. But if you wanted to get all the way to Gundam Wing or whatever was playing next, you had to sit through whatever new anime popped up. And then if you started to like that new anime, then you got to watch again to go back around to get the rest of the episode so you can see the whole thing. And by the time that happens, one of the other animes rotated out. And like the guys who set that up, set it up absolutely perfectly. Yep. <clears throat> to Nami. That's so I gotta tell a little story about the about Chrono Trigger. Please. Like so that was my that was my personal first thing that I owned of of Akira Toriyama type stuff. You know, because everything else I experienced at your house. 
and through things that you guys have done. So after my, you know, after my parents had divorced, you'll probably remember I lived with my dad more than I did my mom. Mm-hmm. And my dad, like when my, when my parents were married, wasn't always like, the closest with us. Like he was very kind of distant. Like he would, you know, he would work all day and then he'd come home and then he was almost kind of miserable. When they, when they got divorced, like my dad, like really tried to, and you, you, you'll remember this too. Like he involved himself more, you know, he, he got, you know, he got to know you guys, you know, he involved, involved himself, especially in a lot of things that I was enjoying, you know, from the, like the, like the, the video game aspect of it, movies, my friends, all kinds of different stuff. And I'll always remember going to, you remember service merchandise? Oh yeah. We went to service merchandise and got, they, they had Chrono Trigger there on clearance. And my dad didn't really, like, he would, he wouldn't buy a lot of games. He bought some, but he didn't buy a lot. But, and I don't remember how much it was, but I remember it being on, like, their front counter or something like that. It was one of those, like, those cardboard sort of, like, uh, display. sort, of, sort of displays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you know, clearance, this section only or whatever. And I remember him picking that up. And like we were there, and he's just like, "Oh, this looks cool." And I, I think I remembered playing it at your house or something like that. I'm like, "Yeah, this this game's awesome." I mean, I I saw the square, the soft, the square soft logo. And, you know, back when we were kids and stuff, that meant that I mean, that was the seal of excellence. Yes, yes, absolutely. You, know, you, you could go no wrong with it. If if you bought a square square soft game, like you were set for the whole freaking summer, or or that whole year until you got your next game or whatever. And my dad bought me Chrono Trigger. And dude, I was obsessed with it. I love that game so much. I'm actually, and that kind of like ties into, you know, Game Dads as a podcast and stuff. You know, the whole, what are you playing? Right now I'm playing Chrono Trigger on my Steam Deck. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's no pun intended. It's timeless. It's got that same, like, we were talking about the, the humor of, of Toriyama. Mm-hmm. You know, like the Johnny character, dude, is like, that's, yeah, that's 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 it, totally. But you know, we were talking about like you know his his obsession with technology and stuff. You got like Robo, kind of you know right next to uh, I was giving her name of Shai Shaya, Sh- the Kingman chick. Oh, uh, Shalia. Yeah, I I can never like pronounce her name very. Uh, but you got like Robo next to her, next to Frog, next to Chrono. It's just it's just really cool. But that was my my personal first. Like thing that I owned that had anything to do with Kira, Kira Toriyama. I my like my first like my favorite part of my my Dragon Ball Z story and the reason like I love it so much is my first Dragon Ball experience is literally Dragon Ball, and I literally watched it like it came on right before school in the morning. And I would stay up to watch it and I would, I would get up early to watch it. And like, I remember the, like I was watching it and I was like, James, my, my, my friend at the time, like this is, I think it was honestly before we met, but I was like, James, look, dude, there's this show that's on and it's called Dragon Ball and it's so awesome and you need to watch it. And like, like, I, I don't know how else to explain it to you, but it's like awesome. And you have to watch the show. And he was like, Nah, I usually watch Garfield in the morning and I'm like, F Garfield, you need to watch this show. And like, F Garfield. <laughs> and like, like he tells me and like, like he never does. He doesn't. And I'm like, okay, man, I, I don't know what to tell you uh, what I'm feeling. I'm, we're, I'm literally, this is like maybe second grade. It might be, it might be third grade, but it might be second grade. I'm like, I don't know how to express to you how I feel about what this show is, but like, you need to watch it. And he never did. And then I think it was maybe fourth grade or fifth grade when Dragon Ball Z came out. And again, I just, I get to like, I watched the first season of Dragon Ball because that's all they ever had. So it's literally just Goku to like the peel off gang. And then Goku turns into a monkey at the end and then it starts back over. So like, <clears throat> Then I like I stumble upon Dragon Ball Z, 
randomly, I get up in the morning, I'm watching TV, and like, it's Goku ver- Goku and Piccolo versus Raditz. And like, in the middle of the fight. And I'm like, this is the coolest goddamn thing I have ever seen. And I am literally in my living room screaming at my brother and my friend Ryan, who was staying the night, to get up and come watch this. And they're like, I don't want to. I'm not getting up. I don't. I'm like, you need to come see this. I need someone else to see what I'm seeing right now. I don't yeah. like get in here. And like, they literally don't. The episode ends and I'm just like sitting there and I'm like, I don't even know how to explain to you what I just saw, but I'm pretty sure it's Goku from Dragon Ball as an adult. I don't know how to explain to you what I'm watching, but that's what's <laughs> happening right now. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you remember Dragon Ball, that show that I showed you that used to come on in the mornings? I am pretty sure that this is him as an adult. I don't know what that means, but that's what's happening. And like, like my brother is finally like, oh, that that actually sounds awesome. And I'm like, and like, it's the first time I had ever seen like a fight that looks like a Dragon Ball Z fight. Like for you guys, like uh, younger kids, that stuff is every day. It's, it's mundane to you at this point, but like to me at like seven, I was like, I don't even know how to explain what I just watched. Like, this is like crazy. Like they're yeah. flying and like punching so fast. You can't see it. And like every uh, screens all over the place and they're firing beams at each other and everything's blowing up. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I don't know how to explain this to you. I am seven, <laughs> but that's what I just saw. And like, my brother, like, I don't know, it finally it clicked in his head that, like, you saw something awesome. And I'm like, I saw the most awesome thing I've ever seen. Like, I don't, like, like I just, like, now that I'm thinking about it, like, to try and, like, I don't even know what I could have possibly said to them to explain what I was looking at. Because, like, literally at that point, I was seven. Like, the most, the biggest, the best reference I could have given them is, like, it looked like, like Street Fighter characters, but like way past that. Like I, I, like I feel bad for seven-year-old Aaron trying to explain to somebody else what Dragon Ball Z looks like without any context. So I'm getting the I'm getting the old wrap it up over here from <laughs> from, your, from your wife. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay, doke. Apparently, you need a shower, my friend. I do. I got a shower before we go pick up Dom. <laughs> I just I took my braids out, so like my hair is in like like you've been stuck in the same position for you know four weeks mode where it just yeah. it looks crazy until I wash it and condition it and stuff. So yeah, I do need to take a shower. Okay, I am going to call this part one of our Dragon Ball Z conversation. Is that cool? Yeah, I wanted. I, yeah, that's very cool. I actually, I kind of want to involve Drake in the next one if we do it. Yeah, sure, um, absolutely. Because, dude, his he has a completely different. End oh my god, to Dragon Ball. I it's yeah, right. yeah. I want yeah that we hundred percent. We'll do another episode. We'll get Drake on here because I the idea of the story I just told in comparison to what the story Drake will tell about his first time watching the experiencing Dragon Ball Z is it's going to yeah. be so different. It. Absolutely. Let's let's do yeah. that. Yeah, and I, I won't spoil anything on that, but like his his take is wild. I wild. I, I'm so, I, that I'm very excited. Like Yeah. That sounds awesome. Okay. So let's do let's let's keep our format and not get all loosey goosey with it. Let's do a very quick what you're playing, a very quick positives, and then we'll go. So what am I playing just currently? On Steam Deck, I've got Chrono Trigger and Castlevania Lords of Shadow. On PlayStation, I am kind of waiting for Visions of Mana. So I've been clearing out my backlog a little bit. I have beaten a few games. The the PSP and PS2 games on, on PS5, that's kind of what I'm playing the most of. Ratchet Clank size matters right now. And I just picked up WWE 2K24 in this summer sale. So I'm actually... I've been playing that the entire time we've been talking. So, <laughs> wrestling games are, the, are that's my kryptonite. Oh, and Final Fantasy VIII. I guess I am playing a lot. Yeah, that's that is a pretty hefty list. Mine is okay. Since the last time we talked, 
I finally beat Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 and put it down, and I'm never going to play it again. I kind of hate it. I, I We can talk about that next time, but I, I kind of hate it. I'm playing Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League, which I want to talk about that next time, too, because I have some opinions that are counter to the narrative that I've been heard, I've heard and been sold. I'm playing this guy five, which I have played tons of. My characters are like super high level, but not high enough level to finish the final boss. So I am going to be kind of intermittently grinding that until I get my characters high enough level to finish the final secret boss. And then I'm going to be done with that game. I'm playing Pokemon Shield. I just started a new game. I have oh, been. God. I have been, I, I know, I know that, I know that it's not the greatest Pokemon entry, but I have been itching for some Pokemon for so long. It just, it creeps up on me and then I'm playing another game. So then I'm like, eh, and then it fades and then it creeps up again and then it fades and it creeps up again and it fades. Well, it crept up at the perfect time I'm playing Pokemon and I'm going to finish Pokemon Shield. I'm going to get to the end. Pokemon, and it, we don't have to get into it. I would actually like to talk about it a little bit on the next episode, but Pokemon is is like herpes. <laughs> I I can totally agree with that because it's it's Pokemon. Or Pokemon is forever. You can't get rid of it. You can't cure it. You can only suppress it. Yep, hundred percent. Because that is exactly what I'm going through right now. Yep, and herpes. my the last game leads into my positive for this episode. So I'm gonna. Say the last game is Super Mario World. And oh. that leads directly into my positive because I am, I decided, I just kind of like, I had the urge and then Dom, my wife has given me the look as she's walking in here. <clears throat> I had the urge and then to play it and I, you know, turned it on and Dom was like, oh, you're going to play Mario? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to play Mario. And she was like, can I play? And I was like, you absolutely can play. So, like, we got her a controller, and we were sitting down on the floor, and literally, she is learning her first video game for real, for real. Like, she's learning Super Mario World. and That's awesome. Walking, she's, you know, walking and jumping over Goombas, and she's she's getting the timing down. Like, first, that it's literally the first level of Super Mario World, and she's just walking and those turtles, the first like set of like five turtles up here that you can like pop with the and get an extra one up. And she's made it past them. She's able to get the Yoshi. She's able to, you know, keep moving past the Yoshi. And last time I was playing with her, she was having issues with the charging Chuck, but she has made it past the charging Chuck at this point and she's made it to the checkpoint. And now she's trying to get through the last bit of that first level. She's almost beaten completely by herself the first level of Super Mario World. That's awesome. That makes me that makes me a very uh, a proud uncle. Yes. It's so. it's it's awesome and like I think it's really good for her because she has this like like she's been running into this thing where she kind of like gives up on things too fast. Mm-hmm. And like Super Mario World is like the idea of her being able to play video games with us is so enticing that she doesn't want to give up. I think it's going to like help her in other ways, just because you know she sees what you can get if you what you can accomplish if you just don't give up and you keep trying. So yeah. it's been, and it's just like it's adorable to see her sitting there like super focused on the screen playing some Super Mario World, and like I'm just that's my positive is just just yeah. the 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 adorable image of my daughter playing her first Super Mario World level. Yeah, I dig it, man. My positive, I got. I got two brief ones. I've been having a really, you know, good time collecting with my son. Again, I said collecting. I'm, I'm more of an enthusiast. I'm not like just buying bulk stuff, but being able to do this with my son, my, you know, he bought the N64 all on his own. He was really excited to share that stuff with me. And like, I'm excited to share my stuff with him. That's been just great. My other positive is that I'm, I'm very thankful for our whole group of friends yesterday was a lot of fun and i'm glad we were able to celebrate your birthday and i i i put 
I put a lot of thought into my into my questions. So like, it, I I had fun doing that. So I'm just I'm very honored that Andrea texted me about that and gave me the opportunity to, to do that for you guys. I'm also I'm so excited because like I could feel it. I could feel it in you in your tone. You totally thought I was not going to have an answer for what's your favorite cereal box. No, I well, I I knew you would because you're you're very good at thinking on your toes. My uh, my favorite one was the, you can't read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Touche. I, I I I love that one. <laughs> I had a different setup to it originally, but like I think the I especially like like your neighbors. Mm-hmm. Ava, I can't remember her, what, what her name is. Sarah, Sarah, okay. Mm. Like they, they don't know me very well yet, but I think that based off of the question, Chris knows me pretty well. Yeah, that was definitely like the that was Brett humor, and like I don't know, man. It just it yeah. turned out better than what I thought it would. Yeah, so y- you you definitely got both of them. <laughs> <laughs> but. Yeah, I was I was very pleased with the way it turned out. So, yeah, thank you, man. I I appreciate it. Well, I it really it was really nice to like because like it's one of those things that you don't actually ever get an opportunity to do to just be like, here's a random reason that I get to explain this story about my babies and why I love them, why they're both so awesome. Like I, I don't you don't yeah. get those opportunities all the time, so it was really nice. I was really thrilled with being able to sum up and like very, very kind of not quickly, but like within 11 questions, you know, half of them were jokes, but be able to kind of take it, like take us on a chronological order of like a timeline of, of where Aaron comes from. And I like that. Yeah. So that, that was, that was my, that was my thought process behind it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome. I really appreciate it. And just to kind of like keep everybody else out there updated, Aaron is a under roll on the toilet paper and everybody should just, if they have a chance to write in on the YouTube comments and stuff, tell them why he's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Tell me, tell me exactly why I'm wrong. And then look up the, the one industry that causes the most deforestation in all of history. And then why you should not care about what the toilet paper industry tells you to do. You're deflecting. You're <laughs> deflecting. You're you're bringing up things that they they definitely matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as where you place your toilet paper roll. It's kind of like it's kind of like you and your Mario Kart stuff, how you challenge me and all that stuff. But you're like, oh, you don't like playing motion control, but yet, like, I still smoke you guys. Yeah. So you're, you know, it, it's all smoke and mirrors, sir. Yeah. Also, if you play motion controls, please go on to the comments and tell Brett how much of a wussy he is for not using motion controls. And then I will also accept your challenge. I will pay for Nintendo Online so I can smoke your ass. Bring it on any time, any day of the week. All right. Well, I just got a second wrap it up signal. So I am going to call this one here. Thank okay. you guys all for listening. Wimini Wham Wham Wazzle. Tom Large Mars sent you. Peace. Bye.